we're actually looking at the actual claims of the system itself. We're not just speculating. And this is one of the issues that I have with Calvinist is, is with regard to the two fallacy and other things is oftentimes the Calvinist will not critique an actual claim of our scholars. They will critique a philosophical conclusion that they're drawing about our position. So for example, with omniscience, well, because God knows all things before he creates, therefore he must determine those things. He must be the one who is the uh, the the one who sovereignly and unchangeably decrees, not by permission, but by his sovereign will, that thing that happens. Well, none of our none of our theologians are claiming that. They are making that claim based upon their finite, limited, linear understanding of how omniscience might work as God gaining knowledge based upon a, a timeline of God doing something prior to something else in a linear way. Um, and that is a philosophical conclusion that our scholars aren't making. But they're, they're making claims about our views, not based upon our actual claims, but based upon philosophical conclusions they come to based upon our claims. We're not doing the same thing. We are, we are actually critiquing the actual claims of Calvinists regarding, for example, him bringing about molestations and rapes and murders for his own glorification, while at the same time also claiming that people are robbing him of his glory. The very thing that he has ordained them to do for his own glory is supposedly robbing him of his glory. This, this is the baffling side of deterministic theology. Um, Breton is responding here and he says, uh, does God decide to whom he will work? I guess in whom, he, sorry, does God decide in whom he will work? Is he the determiner in whom he will work? Can he cause man to do good? Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, the, God can decide in whom he will work. And it's not a mystery as to who he decides in whom to work. The weak. Uh, God chooses the weak to shame the wise. God chooses the lowly. Uh, he, he brings about his plan and his purposes through not Gideon's army when it's strong, but Gideon's army when it's weak. He chooses the the shepherd boy in the, in the field to be the, sh the next king of Israel versus the older brothers who look manly. He chooses the weak uh, mama's boy, Jacob, instead of Esau to be the lineage through which his Messiah would come. Yeah. God chooses with whom he works and he doesn't do so arbitrarily. Uh, he, he states very clear reasons as to why he chooses uh, to, to show mercy to one and not to others. Um, uh, God saves the humble and brings low those eyes who are haughty uh, from, from the Psalms uh, 1827, I believe it is. And so, yeah, Isaiah 61, 266, one, I can't remember the exact reference, but these are the ones I look on with favor. Those with a contrite heart who are humble, who tremble at my word. Um, the, the ones who fear God are the ones he's going to reveal wisdom and knowledge to. So yes, he does decide w in whom he will work. And it tells us exactly in the scripture who those people are. And those people are people who humble themselves, who fear him, who trust in his word. Um, those who fear and trust in him um, aren't earning or meriting their salvation by doing so, by the way. If they were, then they wouldn't need the atonement. They wouldn't need Christ. So humbly confessing that you can't save yourself isn't what saves you. God's grace is what saves you. And so faith doesn't cause regeneration, as we've we talked about recent in a recent Twitter exchange, that Calvinists have this impression that we think faith causes regeneration. No, grace causes regeneration for those who have faith. And he does so mercifully. He doesn't, God doesn't, is not obligated to regenerate those who have faith or those who humble themselves or those who fear the Lord. He chooses to do so graciously. He doesn't have to. Um, and, and so it's, it's not an arbitrary decision. In other words, it's not a, a, a it's not a unilateral a choice of God before uh, or without regard to anything in the creation. The scriptures clearly tell us exactly why he chooses to work in some and not others. Um, Ezekiel 18, prior to chapter 36, he goes into pretty great detail about this, that if, if you humble yourself, you confess your sins, that you will get a new heart. Um, repent so as to live, he says. He doesn't say, I'll make you alive so that you'll certainly repent. He says, repent so as to be made alive. Why do you refuse to come to me so that you may have life, as, as Jesus asked the Pharisees? You refuse to come to me. That, that's the first order. You come to me so as to have life. You eat of my flesh. You drink of my blood so as to live. It's not, I will unilaterally make you alive so that you will do this. Um, and again, this is the, the reversing of the order salutis in scripture that the Calvinist uh, is forced to do in order to make their theology work, to make their systematic, their deterministic systematic work. They have to reverse the order of salvation and they ultimately have to put regeneration, give a new life prior to faith and uh, a humble response to the father.
That's just not the order of the scripture. The prodigal son was lost. He was dead in his pigsty. He humbled himself first, came home, and then he's found. He's made alive. He's restored as a son. So the order salutis in, in every passage of scripture and every narratives of scripture, of every parabolic example of how it happens, um, the order is, is that the person humbles themselves prior to being uh, redeemed, prior to being restored, prior to being reconciled, prior to being regenerated, prior to being given new life. Um, these things have been written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name, John 20, 31. So what's the order? By believing you may have life in his name. Faith comes prior to belief. And when people stand against that, is even as well-intending as they may be, uh, like I'm sure Brenton is, um, he's not going to get it right until he goes to the Bible versus his philosophy and his theology, his, his systematic. And so what, Cal what Brenton does, in my estimation, I'm sure he's well-intending, is instead of going to the Bible to answer that question, he goes to his systematic to answer the question first and foremost. His tradition in my, in my opinion, his tradition is overarching and overriding his interpretation of the scriptures. Because I think if he was being consistent within the scriptures, he would see verses that I've just quoted and go, oh, okay, I got it wrong. Belief does precede the new life. And he would and he would change his theology based upon that scripture passage. But once you've adopted a, a certain systematic, sometimes it's really hard to see the scriptures for what they're saying. It's really difficult to go, okay, maybe, maybe my systematic is dictating how I read the text versus the other way around, allowing the text to inform and to help me to develop my, my understanding of who God is in his systematic.